In the middle of your night, there's a Christian nightlight beaming the good news from 1,149 feet in the air, piercing the darkness with a bright ray of hope. From the tallest freestanding observation tower in the United States, breaking the bondage of temptation by booming down into Sin City's late night Las Vegas strip, broadcasting live, coast to coast, and streaming around the world on the internet. He's prayed with thousands, and now he's ready to pray with you the dynamic prayer of faith on the all-new Pray America Live. Here's Midnight's Radio Pastor, David Wood. And come on in the room, this is Evangelist David Woods. I'm happy to have you with me tonight. We go to go from Orlando, Florida to Las Vegas. And place in between. What a night we're going to have tonight. It's going to be a great night to be with you. In the name of Jesus. Hi, everybody. This is Evangelist David Woods. And I hope you had a wonderful, glorious uh, Mother's Day weekend. Did you? If it was like me, it was busy. I mean, really, extremely, ultra, overboard, busy. And um, we had some real technical issues. I mean, real issues last night. Got everything going back again so I could be with you today. But my phones, you know, this is a very expensive phone system. This is built for radio. What is this? uh, $5,000 system, maybe more. I forget. It's paid in full, but this one, when the lights flash back and forth like that, that means there's a power issue. I have no calls tonight, which um, discourages me a bit because that's what it's all about is getting calls and hearing from you. Um, Thank you, Titus, for being my partner. I did receive that. And I want to hear from uh, you tonight, but we can't take calls tonight. So <clears throat> I want to I want to say a few things. I got several things on my mind, several things on my heart. Oh, I got a lot going on in my mind for you. Let me just start by saying that this Bible, you've heard me talk about it, the children's Bible, is a very unique, one-of-a-kind Bible, laugh and learn Bible, fun for kids, for children, and my my little one, she loves this. My little boy, he loves this. I mean, they they absolutely eat it up. And uh, it doesn't take long. I give them a little story. I think we're on Joseph. No, we went through Joseph. We went through Abraham. We went through Cain and Abel. We went through Adam and Eve. I forget what story we're on next. But it's just it's just about two pages. And you show your children you're investing in their life at a young age. Don't wait till they're 10 and 12 and 14, 18. Start investing in their life. If you missed it before six, you missed it all together. You got to invest in them when they're little. When they're just little babes and they're coming up. And so, wow, what a weekend we had. And it was uh, stirring. And I, I just kept thinking to myself for you, been praying for many so many of you uh i've been thinking about your steps in victory your steps in faith and i'd just like to say this tonight that a step of faith is a step in victory and i really want to drive that home to you tonight that you may not feel like you're making you know 10 or 20 or 50 steps yes pete all my life uh, for those of you who listen by radio, Pete in Michigan says, we're praying for you, Brother Woods. Please don't be discouraged by by um, the enemy. And uh, I've been doing this 40 years. And believe me, it's easier today than it was 30 years ago. Much easier. Um, those were the days I think I gave up every Monday morning. <laughs> Came back again on Tuesday. Those were hard times hard times but but that's why i can teach victory that's why i can teach faith that's why i can preach faith and preach victory to you because some of you are starting on your journey of faith some of you have been journeying with the lord for a long time and it's a big deal 
it's a big deal to try to live by faith. But the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Now, what does it mean to be just? Justified is just as if it never happened, just as if I never done it. Well, how do you get there? By being covered in the blood of Jesus and your life, your thoughts, your motives, your your example, your livelihood, your your thinking, your ways, your character, your integrity, all has to be covered all the time, nonstop, never a break in the blood of Jesus. And if you see that you're in Christ and Christ is in you, then you are justified just as if it never happened, just as if you never did it. And so the just shall live by faith. The just, are you justified? Then you're gonna have to live by faith. There's no other, there's no other choice for you. See, I guess the world doesn't have to live by faith because they're not justified in the blood of Jesus. But if you've chosen to be justified in the blood of Jesus, then you're going to have to live by faith whether you like it or not. If you call yourself a believer, if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself self blood bought, you're justified, you're, you're going to heaven, <laughs> then you got to realize that there's no other lifestyle for you but the life of faith. But a step of faith is a step toward victory. And some of you are facing some things, big things right now, some big challenges. And you need to know, you need to hear that your life is going to be full of victory. It's coming. It's coming, beloved. All the words of favor, all the words of grace, all the words of prophecy that came on you before are going to be fulfilled in the name of Jesus. I declare it. Everybody giving a love gift of $100 in the month of May, we want to send you Laugh and Learn Bible for Kids. Don't put it off. Don't delay. Go online to monthlypartners.com. Give a gift of $100 or more, and I'll send this out to you. Our back order uh, just came in, and so we're ready to reship those that um, ready to receive that. With God's grace and his favor, his honor, and his face toward me, towards you, we can accomplish anything. All you have to do is take the next step. What is the next step? You don't have to do it all at once. Just take the next step. Somebody called it baby steps, right? And, and uh, somebody asked me once, they, they said to me, your destination is a thousand miles from here. Each mile is connected to the next, end on end, and you have to travel them one at a time. There's no other way to get to any place except one mile at a time. I remember traveling as a youngster with my parents, with my family, and and lots of Christian believers from around the world. We'd fill up two jumbo jets and fly over to Asia every year and minister week after week, about two to three weeks at a time. It takes so long. I guess Australia beats them all. What is it, 30 hours to Australia? Depending on where you're flying from, but I think it's 22 to in the air to the Philippines and to Taiwan. But I've thought about that many times, you know, going as a youngster, wherever you're going, it's one mile at a time. And you don't have to go a thousand miles. You only have to go one mile and then another, and then another, and then another until with God's power, you look up and realize You've arrived there. You got there. And after that, there'll be another step to take. Placed before you by the Holy Spirit. Another journey of faith. Another adventure of glory. But always one step at a time. It's the only way you can follow anyone. is one step at a time. I remember being around my spiritual mother, Nora Lamb, the author of China Cry, the movie. Did you see it? 
my job was to carry bags and carry microphones and once in a while I'd have to carry her briefcase and once in a while I was just a young kid you know 16 15 12 12 was when I first started but I'd step on her toes and boy she would let me know it ah! <laughs> she was God's anointed woman of faith to the world but if you stepped on her toes, she is a whole different person. <laughs> Wasn't funny at the time. You know, you're moving around in the airport and you're going around the world and you're traveling and you're moving. That's the last thing you want is to have somebody step on your toes when you're going mile after mile. The, the Bible says in Psalms 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps of a good man. Are you a good man or a good woman? Then your steps are ordered by God. Say that out loud. Say my steps are ordered by God. Oh yeah. God is not holding you responsible for step three, step 45, step eight or 12 is just holding you responsible for the next step, the step of faith, what you're supposed to be doing now. He's not holding you responsible even for the success of the journey. He'll take care of that. He'll deal with that. You're responsible for taking the next step by faith. And that's why it's so critical that the conditions of your life are perfectly matched so that faith can flow in your life and you can be responsible for this mile. Everybody wants to take care of mile 37 or 26 or mile 49. I can't get to mile marker 101 until I deal with this step, with this mile. And so it's a step of faith, being obedient to his word, and to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I don't know, people think I'm strange, but I, I'm led by the Spirit. I want to be led by the Holy Spirit more than I want to be led by the end goal in mind. A lot of people are being led by the goal when they should be being led by the Spirit. That's a word for somebody. The Word of God says obedience is greater than sacrifice. I know you made some great sacrifices, but your obedience is greater. I heard a preacher one time say that your obedience is greater than your genius. You might be the smartest man in the world and try to short circuit the system. Try to take a shortcut. I was in third grade, and me and my brother, we missed the bus. And Mama said, if you miss the bus, I'm not taking you. You're going to walk. Whew. I never forgot that. We missed the bus. <laughs> and so true to her word, those were the days when you could make your child walk, you know, and it'd be perfectly safe. <sighs> True to her word, me and my brother took off and we knew we were in trouble a second time for being late. And I got the brilliant genius idea of cutting through, you know, the road went down all the way and then over. And the only thing that separated it was a field a potato field. It's still there today. I'm 53 this year and it's still in third grade. It's still what it was today was it was then. That's amazing. But I got the brilliant genius idea to take a shortcut. My younger brother followed me and it was a genius idea had it not been Oregon and rain 
and pure solid mud in the middle. I sincerely thought my legs were going to come out the other side of the world in China. And I lost a shoe. I showed up at school with mud up to my waist and a missing shoe and a trouble with the principal's office and a phone call to mom. And I'm sure I'm confident that my mom regrets to this day not taking me and making us walk. It was the genius that made me do a shortcut through the mud field. And I think about that today. What kind of shortcuts can I take today? Mm-mm. I surmise it real good. Now, before I take another muddy shortcut across the field, it looked great. I mean, it didn't look muddy at all. It just looked like dirt. But you get out in the middle and you can't get out. It's like quicksand, brother. That was a good shoe, too. It's probably still there. It's probably way down deep in that potato field somewhere. It's gone. Because of the shortcut. Now, let me just talk to you like a pastor. Let me talk to you like a dad to my children. What are you shortcutting? You're navigating through life. and What are you shortcutting? Where are the shortcuts in your life that are turning out to be a big mud hole? A big fat sinkhole in your life. You cannot shortcut God. You cannot do a shortcut on prayer. And you certainly can't just throw a seed in the ground and shortcut faith. You're going to be in the same predicament with the same consequence to your behavior, and it's called regret. Look at the regrets in your life, and you can see there was probably a shortcut somewhere where I could cut the system, short circuit the system and go a different way. And I think of that when I think of this scripture in Psalms. God, a a good man, a good man's ways, paths are ordered by the Lord. God orders my steps and I have to go through fifth grade before I can get to sixth grade and so on and so forth. I have to learn some foundational truths before I can get real strong in the Lord to be able to handle the stake of God's word, meat, the Bible calls it. So don't let that keep you from from taking that baby step. Maybe the moment all you can do is something small. The next step may seem so insignificant that it, It couldn't count for much. It's so small, it doesn't mean anything. Don't let that keep you from taking the next step. To refuse to step out because your offering is so small. One boy told me one time, he said, he was 15 years old. He said, preacher, I come every night with my mom and we really like your preaching. It's a big, high compliment to me when a youngster tells me they like my preaching and really listen. And he said to me, I'm embarrassed because he said, I don't have a real man's job. That's what he said. He said, I just cut lawns and my tithe is only about $5. And he says, I'm embarrassed to put it into the plate Man, I took advantage of the moment to teach him that the little things add up. And I pulled him aside and I told him, there are adults in here who have big adult jobs and don't even give $5. And I said, furthermore, 
it's big to God. Whatever you're sacrificing for the Lord, he sees the sweat, he sees the labor, he sees your time, he sees all your hard work, your efforts, your job, because you refuse to take a step it will cost you dearly. But if you say, I'm going to take a step, even if it's small, even if it's a $5 seed into the ground, it's not the amount. God's not trying to get rich off of you. If God was trying to get rich off of somebody, he surely wouldn't be coming seeing us. <laughs> right? God's not trying to get rich. God owns it all. Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I told the Lord, I said, I need a whole herd, Lord. I need the whole herd. But this refuse to step out because your offering is small or because whatever step you take looks insignificant compared to the problems you're facing is an act of defeat instead of an act of faith. And I see a lot of people, a lot of Christians today Defeated right here. Look at me right here. That's where they're defeated. And I really, really love you enough to say, kill the defeat in your mind. Tell defeat to leave. And tell defeat, I'm going to take, if I have to, a million baby steps end upon end to get where God wants me to go. Get the defeat out of your mind and start acting on faith. And I want you to think about real clearly today, tonight, what does Jesus say in Mark 4, 30, 31, and 32? Let me read it to you. Wherefore shall we liken the kingdom of God or what com comparison shall we compare it to? And he went on. Well, it's like a grain of mustard seed, which is sown in the earth. It's less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, when it's thrown out there, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs. Listen, the sun didn't say, I'm deciding to sleep in today. You might have, but the sun never does. Not one single time. Why? Genesis 8, 22, as long as the earth remaineth, there is seed, time, and harvest. And just as solid as a rock, that sun's coming up. I saw it this morning as it peeked over the mountain top and blurted into my daylight window and and kissed me on the cheek and said hello and i said thank you god for another morning who did that who can do that but god there's no president or king that can look at the sun and say well you're not coming up today no way. It's not happening. And Jesus said, look at the most smallest insignificant seed. When you put it in the ground, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air, the birds, may lodge under the shadow of it. Listen, to refuse to plant is to refuse growth. I was thinking about my own life. Yesterday I was planning, a day before yesterday I guess, I was planting some little plants in their little pots. Of course, that's real simple. You got to have soil, the right kind. You got to, on some of them, put a little food on the top and then don't forget the water. And then you got to make sure they have sunlight. That's so simple. And I was thinking about that with me. I was thinking as I put a pepper in one 
green pepper and a tomato and another and a, why did I get it? Something else. A pepper and a tomato. Oh, and a dill pickle. Cucumber. <laughs> it won't be a dill pickle till, till it's in vinegar, but it's going to be a cucumber. Just little plants in the bucket, you know. And I put them in, put dirt around it, soil, and did all what was right. And then I sat back on my little couch on my patio and looked at it. And uh, thought goes through your mind, now what are you waiting for? Well, you're waiting for it to grow, to bear fruit, to bear fruit. And I found myself every day now, what has this been, three days ago? I found myself looking and going out there every day. And I thought, ain't nothing coming up out of here overnight. And I tell myself, well, it's not about that. It's just making sure it's protected from the wind. We had bad winds around here and it's making sure it's got enough water, not overwatered. You know, you don't want the leaves turning yellow and checking up on it. And, um, when I thought that thought, I thought of you, not all of you, the ones that care enough to empower the vision. Now, if you asked me to pray, I would. But I thought of Pete and Michelle and Israel and Alex and Tammy and Stacy and, and Leanna and Daniel, and his mother and, and Tia and Jeff and Jackie and, and Ron, and Stacy and TJ and Sue. Jim and Joanne, mm -hmm. there's four pages of you. I hold on to that. And I think to myself, now Sue is a tomato where Jeff is a pepper. <laughs> Stacy is an apple and Tammy is a pear. Huh? Israel's a watermelon. He blows the shofar. And I got a whole garden here. And I think to myself every day, I'm praying over them in the spirit. That's really what a, a good pastor does. A good pastor doesn't try to be the star of the show every Sunday. He spreads the love and he helps develop gifts and characters and talents and abilities and says, you do the worship this week and you do the worship next week. And I want you to get your feet wet, come and give me a five, 10 minute sermon and learn to preach in the pulpit. And I don't know where that kind of pastoring has gone. There are so many pastors today that everybody look at me. And it's not about that. Uh, it's about willing to get your hands dirty and stick a seed in the ground and put some water on it and then come check on it every day and make sure it's growing up to maturity to bear fruit. Oh, that's good preaching. Holy ghost. I think I'll say amen myself. We don't have a lot of people doing that today. Father, I lift up all my partners, all my prayer warriors, all those that are both Terry's in Michigan and, so many of them who love Angela and I and pray for this style and this type of ministry, Lord. They're my first, first fruit. They're the ones that I'm concerned with the most, the most, the most, the most. Yes, Robin, Chandra, Joanne, Rev. Praise the Lord, all y'all watching. Sybil, praise God. Yeah, you wouldn't want to walk that one, Terry, 12 miles uphill. Mm -mm. But to refuse to plant is to refuse growth. Now, let's get your mind off of money for a moment. Let's talk about Bible. 
There's ordinary average people coming and going in and out of the stream of your life. And they've never picked up a Bible maybe once. It's never interest them. They don't know what it says. They know what everybody else says, but they didn't, they've never read it for themselves. They have no clue. They're totally in the dark. They are dumb as a bag of rocks when it comes to theological questions. It's really not their fault. But they've got somebody like you that's in their life that could sow a seed into their ears. Somebody in your life has never once in their lifetime heard somebody tell them the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Somebody's never heard the fact that God could make you rich in fruit and in abundance by getting on the life cycle of life, the life system, the God way. They've never heard it. and They don't know it. And if somebody like me were to tell them, they'd think it's another con you have the ability one-on-one to say to somebody, you know, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We're back. Just to have somebody hear you say, it's more blessed to give than to receive, is goes totally contrary to what the person has been told all their life. Someone may hear that and think it's a fairy tale. So just to let you know, we've lost a camera and we've lost our phones. And if this one goes out tonight, it's good night for the night. But we'll get it working again tomorrow night. And thank you for being patient with me. (laughs) Uh, When things like that happen, you just laugh. What can you do? What can you do? To refuse to plant the word in somebody's life is to refuse something growing in somebody's life. So here's what I want to say. What 
is growing in you that God has planted? What is growing in you that you have planted? And what is growing in you that the enemy, the devil, has planted? So in order to know that, it may take a season of communion. It may take a time where you say, I'm going to judge myself because I want to know really all the stuff that's growing in the garden of my heart for God. I told my children this today at the dinner table. Yes, when we're home, we have dinner and everybody gets around the table and they get to hear me whether they like it or not. <laughs> and I said, I was talking about a young lady, young, and a child that died. And I taught my children again, early death is a sign oftentimes that somebody did not judge themselves. We were talking about a seven-year-old that died in an automobile accident and that's tragic. And well, how did that seven-year-old, how, how did they not judge themselves? They're seven years old. I said, do you know how the child died? Yes. They, they weren't wearing a seatbelt. I said, I wonder how many times the mother or the father told them to sit down and wear that seatbelt or perhaps Perhaps the parents did never judge him, didn't take the correct disciplinary action to make sure that they were sitting down in their seatbelt, perhaps. And they never thought of that before. And I said, every early death is a sign of a non-judgment in your life. You didn't judge properly. If I go down there and I take a jar of arsenic and tell God, okay, God, I'm going to drink this and I expect you, that's foolishness and presumption and you will be right dead as quick as you can say dead. Or hold up a snake and run around a church like a Lulu bin with your needing your head examined. It's not faith. It's foolishness and presumption, it's stupidity. You don't tempt the Lord God. So you got to figure out what's growing on the inside of you. What's growing on the inside of me? And, and let's go through it and see what belongs. Because I can go out to the garden, I can go out the side of the house, and I can show you some things that are growing. And there's some things that belong. There's some things that should come out, thistles, weeds. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that a bird planted just outside my window. I have a beautiful, beautiful fern. It's been in there seven years now. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and loves the shady spot. And nobody planted it. I know it come from a bird. That's okay. I like it. What's planted in you right now that's planted by accident that somebody else planted that you didn't even know was there? Perhaps it was a thought that says all preachers should be poor. Perhaps it was a parent who said, oh, no, son, come here. Don't go in into the ministry. You'll end up in the poor house all your life. That's an awful, awful thing to teach your child. If God's hand and call is on your child's life, let him follow that. Let him follow that. We live in a culture today that idolizes football stars. By the way, they say NFL is the number one, uh, number one pusher. It's not the right word. The number one actively involved in gambling. 
I thought less of the NFL when I thought of that. We got parents idolizing the NBA, the MLB, and NHL, hockey, football, basketball, and they're pushing their children to sports. You don't know it, but it can be an idol in your life, but you were never, you were never aware of that because you were never taught that. Other children go onto the stock market or into business and their whole ambition as life is to take and make as much money as they can and stick it away and don't tell anybody a thing. Shh. Are, are you following? The ambitions in your heart are from seeds that have been sown and somebody stuck them there. Somebody planted them there a long time ago. You were told that a good preacher should take a vow of poverty. Perhaps you were told other lies. Like, you know, money's the root of all evil. It's a lie. Somebody said, yeah, it's right over there in the Bible there in the good book. No, it's not. Your parents and their parents and their parents and right on down generation after generation, they got it all messed up and they told you a lie inadvertently. They didn't know they were telling you a lie. They never took the time to explore it. And they told you money is the root of all evil when it's not. The scripture says the love of money is the root of all evil. Do you see what I'm talking about? Things, little things matter. And there are certain things planted in you that you don't know that are planted in you. I prayed perhaps one of the most dangerous prayers today. Getting out of the shower and getting dressed and I said, Jesus, show me what I'm believing that may not be what you're believing. That puts you sort of in a vulnerable spot. It feels vulnerable. But he's your daddy. He's not going to beat you or abuse you or abandon you. Or... Mm -mm. And I was in good company. I, I said to him, I said, the Lord is my shepherd. And I want you, Lord, to show me things in my, if, if my eschatologic, eschatological thinking, the, the thought pattern of the end times, if, if that's off, show me more. If, if there's some little thing that I don't, that maybe I grew up on, take it from me. It really grieves me, and I know it grieves you, to see two old white guys in Georgia take the life of a, of a black man. First, it makes me mad, angry, and it makes me sad. And, and here's what I want to say about that. The man said, somebody said, well, he might have been stealing a, a nail gun or a toolbox. It, is it worth, is it worth that? Is it worth blowing a hole through a young man? If it was stealing indeed, which I don't really believe that it was, but God knows. But let's say it was. Was it worth killing somebody over? The answer is no, in case you didn't know. Yeah, but I got a right to my property. Yeah. But if he was after a nail gun, you should have given him the saw and the lumber to go with it and ask him. But see, see, people, they call themselves Christians and they got wrong things growing on the inside of them. What's growing in me that's dysfunctional? What's growing in me 
that Jesus winces at. I don't care about what people think. That's that's a whole nother issue. I just I just want to please the opinion of the Holy Spirit. What does he think? What what is his opinion? What are his thoughts on it? If I can find that out, I'll be okay. One pastor said, oh, we don't want to have David Woods back again because he was talking about seed, time, and harvest. Well, go ahead. Let your people die financially. And then you'll just encounter more people. You, you'll be like the turnstile in your church. People will come and go, come and go. You'll have a new crop of people about every, I would say, three to four years. Because because they won't be getting results. They won't be seeing fruit in your ministry and their ministry, and they won't they won't have an understanding. And you'll just be you'll be a wheelhouse. They'll just be pouring in and pouring out, pouring in, pouring out. But you didn't teach them. You didn't take the the matter of stewardship important, like God takes it. Oh, I don't want to offend Daddy Big Bucks. Well, Daddy Big Bucks is already offended. That's how he got his big bucks. And if you're there to please Daddy Big Bucks, you're in trouble to begin with. Oh, yes, but Sister Big Mouth, she might get upset and leave. She probably should be somewhere else anyways. If you don't have the the manhood, the, the, the adultness to stand up and make the correction, you're not a leader. You're a follower. Oh, that really gets pastors upset when you start talking that way. They're just trying to meet the budget. If you want to meet the budget, get rid of the sock. Get yourself a 45-gallon trash can and start taking the gospel out to the streets and teach people that Jesus, what his words are, give and you shall receive. Good measure. Press down, shaking together, and running over. And if they don't like it, you say, here's the Bible. Take it up with the master. Read it for yourself if you're offended. I'm not the bread. I'm the, I'm the signpost to the bread. Don't shoot the messenger. Just a servant boy. You understand? All I am. To refuse to plant is to refuse to grow. And I got to ask myself, and I ask it, I've been asking it for years. What is David Woods planning today? I'm not talking about my pepper or my tomato. I'm talking about spiritual things now. Seeds plant, grow, when they are planted, watered, and then tended to, cared for. I want you to consider Ephesians 6, 13 and 14. This may be your next step. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. And if you can't tell what the next step in your situation is, take the step of taking your stand on God's word. Right here. That's the next step. (laughs) When I first started preaching, I was young. Johnny Moore and Emma Pearl Moore, Nancy Harmon's sister and brother-in-law, had a little tiny church in southeast Portland in the area called Montevilla. And the little white building was the original building where T. T. L. Osborne T.L. and Daisy Osborne got off the mission field and came to the United States and started, started that work in a little tiny building. And um, they asked me to come and, and minister a week revival. That was the first extended meeting I ever did. And I was probably 17, 16, 17 years old. Now, up until then, I had always um, done individual day meetings, preach for somebody on a Sunday morning, minister for somebody on a Sunday night, sing. 
But this was my first real revival and Nancy Harmon set it up for me and they were thrilled to have me and she treated me like a mother treats a son. Come here, baby. Come here, honey. Next time you get up to preach, I don't want you to say it quite like that and stay away from this scripture. You're too young to start on that. Well, that was good training. What was she doing? Well, when I was 16, 17 years old, I thought she just was on a, on sort of a power trip, but it didn't take me long to look at it and see it wasn't a power trip at all. She was planting something in me. I'll never, never, never forget or be ungrateful or thankful. She's with the Lord today. Some of his books are over here, my shoulder. Old ones, 1964. <laughs> you know, the word never changes. But she was planting in me. At your church where you go to, is there somebody there that's young, 15, 16, that you would dare pull aside and say, have you ever thought about God using you in the ministry? You might shock them. You might get their parents upset. But is there somebody that you could, I encounter it all the time, young people, and I just obey the Lord. I'm thinking about one young man in South Carolina, North Carolina. He had all these plans and the word of the Lord came forward and he's going in the ministry now. What is he, 18? What are you planning in somebody else's life? What kind of what thought has been planted as a seed? When I was 21, 22, no, 20, maybe a little older, 25, my mother had brought my little nephews down to meet me in the desert in, a, in the Las Vegas area where I was ministering. And we went to have lunch at a place. This is an embarrassing story, but I, I use it as an illustration. And on your way to lunch there in Las Vegas, you have to pass by maybe 10,000 casino slot machines. And I had the stupid idea to my nephews. I said, let me show you this machine. Just eat up your money. And I just right in front of my mother, put it in there and pulled it. Bing, 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 bing. I was trying to teach them that it's going to steal from you. And instead it hit the jackpot. My mom, well, we shouldn't have been in a place like that anyways, but we were going just to eat lunch. And those nephews got something planted in them by my stupidity. I'm not a gambler. I don't like it. It's, there's so much wrong with it. And I, I looked on that and I thought, oh, how stupid. So I took every penny. And I got it in a check and I mailed it to, <laughs> I mailed it to foreign missions <laughs> and never did, never taught like that again. But, but the point is somebody's planning something in you right now and you got to figure out what's being planted and then begin to discern the type of planting of the Lord. You are the planting of the Lord. You're the vineyard of God. You're in the vineyard. You're, you're popping out fruit everywhere. To refuse to plant is to refuse growth. Are you hearing? Seeds grow when they're planted, when they're watered, and when they're taken care of. But your next step needs to be, after you've done all you can do, stand. You know you can do too much to the plant. You can get over there and cut on it until it dies. Just stand. If you can't tell what the next step is in your situation, take the step of taking a stand on God's word and don't be moved. 
And every day, read over those promises. You're standing on those promises and, and start praising God until he shows you the next step to take. If you say, well, Brother Woods, I, I don't know what promises from the Bible to stand on. Then you just have to identify your next step. And how do I identify? Well, you just did. By saying, I don't know what promises to stand on. Start reading the New Testament until you locate your situation. And the promises of God that cover that situation. Don't try to take some other step until you take that one. Stand on the word. Go through the word. Go through the New Testament and say, God, show me a story or a situation or Bible, paracopy or something, paragraph that applies to my situation. Don't, don't try to take some other step until you take that one. No one can believe God without first hearing the word of God. Now, I'm just limited on time here tonight we can get everything fixed in the studio back up our lights are coming hallelujah thank you jesus joanne i hope you're shouting with me tonight lights are coming they said thursday we're going to have a whole new looking place it looks like around here second peter third one through three and four one, chapter one verse three and four according as his divine power god has given unto us all things that per- i love this scripture He's given unto us all things that pertain to, unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How does corruption come? It's in the world through lust. Lust, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Lust brings corruption to your life. That's what's wrong with lust. Some people's marriage is built on lust, not love. And when they hit their older years and everything starts sagging and bagging and there's no more lust, all they have left is corruption. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just preaching to you today from the word of God. Second Peter one, three and four. Let me read it again. According to his divine power, God has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption, not having escaped the the lust, escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. God's word covers every possible situation in life. I want you to get this. It is a source of divine life and power with which we overcome the ungodly things that the storms of life throw at us. One step of faith, you can always take it write it down is praise. You can always praise God regardless of your situation, whether you feel like it or whether you don't. Praise is the perfect will of God at any time and regardless how far out the will of God things may look at the moment you're in, praise is always an act of faith, particularly when it's accompanied with the step of taking your stand. Another step that can always be taken in any situation is giving. Even when it looks like there's nothing to give, take the step and give anyway. Money's not the only thing available for giving. Look around. Maybe you want to take over a casserole dish to your negative, drunken neighbor. Oh, brother, I only give to Christians. Well, that's part of the problem. Let your light shine. Money's not the only thing that you can give. Look around. Clean out your closet. 
If there's nothing left, then give of yourself. Go find someone and pray for them. I'm going to do that tonight. Ron, I'm going to pray for you tonight. There are a lot of people these days for whom just a warm, heartfelt smile would be a wonderful gift. Get involved with getting the gospel out to the world. When you sow into this ministry, that's what you're doing. Busy your hands and busy your feet. If you don't have anything else to give, don't make it some kind of religious work now. Make it an act of faith. Believe that every smile is a seed planted and expect the harvest to come of joyful people in your life. As you sow that seed, do it as a step, baby step, step toward God, step toward victory, a step of faith. And, and remember, don't ever forget, always step on the devil's neck. No matter how big a task you're facing today, no matter how overwhelmed your situation might be, I want you to remember, all you have to do is take the next step. Beloved, I, I knew I couldn't be with you for long tonight, and I normally come and get on the phones, and I really want to talk to you because that's what this program is about. But even if I'm just down to one camera, I wanted to pray over you. You're my partner. I couldn't come last night with technical issues, but I could. I, I did pray for you. And we're getting it back up and getting it going. One of these days, I'm going to have a... Uh, you don't know how to hear that. I'm going to have a big studio. Right? I, if you could see where I am right now, you, you would laugh. I'm crammed. I'm literally jammed in here. <laughs> but it's baby steps. Oh, yeah, I got it planned out in my heart exactly what I want to build our ministry studio so that I can come to you every single night and have good quit equipment that doesn't go on the blink like this and have enough power to where things don't fail in the middle of a broadcast. It's coming. It's coming. Beloved, I don't care how big a task you're facing. I don't care how overwhelming your situation seems right now. All you have to do is take the next step. What is it? Stand up. Look up. Step out. God's word's going to be there to hold you up. Angela and I love you and we pray for you every day. I'm going to teach you tomorrow, Lord willing, how to not let your heart be troubled. If you're watching this on a rebroadcast, you can forward it to the next one. Don't let your heart be troubled. I'm going to talk to you about that tomorrow. Let me see if anybody's taking a step of faith in their giving tonight online. No, nothing tonight. But I got my partners, and a lot has come in the mail today from our last week's little share whatever you call it. The Spirit of the Lord just took over. We're grateful and thankful for every pledge, every donation, every, if you made a pledge and you haven't done it, sit down and put it in the mail, write to me, go online, update your giving. Let us see that you are taking steps of faith. Each one on here, God knows. And these are precious, precious people to me. Everyone. Some of you I haven't heard from since January. Some of you I've heard from this as recently as today. Rita in Kentucky, I love you. Joanne and Jim, you are the apple of God's eye. Cheryl from Portland, I got your letter just yesterday. What a blessing you are. Jeanette from Tacoma, I have not heard from you since January. Mary from East Washington State. I have not heard from you for months. 
Israel, thank you. I love you, brother. Your your blessing. Liana in Minnesota, bless you. Titus, you blessed me today on Cash App. I was asking the Lord what I was going to do, and here it comes. Just wow, 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 wow. Lord, I'm ever mindful of you, and I'm ever mindful of my partners. They're a gift to what you've called me to do, Lord. They're the fuel. They're the empowerment. You've raised them up. You've put it in their heart to support us. And although they are not our source, God, you are our source of supply. I ask you to bring seed to the hands of the sowers. Every person that's watching and listening to my voice that wants to be a sower, God, I pray miraculously, supernaturally, drop seed in their hand. The just shall live by faith. Lord, help them to take the next step. It might be small. It may seem insignificant. God, give them the strength to give them the next step, to step out just like Peter stepped out of the boat. Thank you, Jesus. No lack in your life. Nothing but abundance. I declare that everything in your life is coming up roses. You hear me? I declare it in the name of Jesus. Everything in your life is coming up roses. I know it's just an expression, but I'm using it. Dennis Hall, I pray victory over your body. I pray every physical challenge has to go. Sue my sister. I rebuke the devourer in Jesus' name. I take authority over sickness and disease, pain and infirmity, that which is disordered in your body. I command it to go. I command it to go. I command it to go in Jesus' name. And I plead the blood, the blood of Jesus over your body right now. In Jesus' name. Terry, I pray for resurrection in your car. God, give them a better car. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, I pray right now, victory. Yes, Pete, I can take it right here. Jesus, I thank you for victory coming. Jane, I sensed you were watching tonight. I didn't see it till just now, but I sensed. Lord, touch Jane. Heal the loneliness in her heart. Take it from her, oh God. She's a mighty woman of God. You've always been there with her. In the good times and the bad, in the thick of the thin, God, you've been there with her. Jesus, give her a miracle, oh God. Financially, break it open. Oh God, we know where Carrie is, Lord. We know where he is. It doesn't help us any to know where he is, Lord. We still miss him. He was such a blessing to me as a youngster. Omar, become subscribe to my YouTube, will you? Candy, great to see you here on here tonight. Michelle, God bless you. Oh, let the Spirit of the Lord just come over you right now. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit come over you. Just let it be like oil that ran down the beard of Aaron. Ha <laughs> ha. Let the healing oil of Jesus come over you tonight. Father, I lift, lift up one of our bishops tonight. Lord, his wife took the journey to heaven. It just seemed like yesterday I was taking a picture with her and she was singing song. He lives at Easter, at Resurrection Sunday, and now she's with you, Lord. God, comfort Comfort my friend Don's heart, Lord. It's got to be so hard for him. Give him peace, Lord. I know he's not watching tonight, but Lord, you know where he is. You know what he's going through. You know the battle he's facing. Yes, Dennis, I'm believing God to get you out of that situation. You'll be walking and leaping and praising God again. In the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus the power and the anointing that you once felt with your dad and your mom let it come down over you 
hidden away in the shadow of the Almighty. Oh, God, pour out your glory upon each one. Jesus, heal this equipment. Help this equipment to work. Lord, even though technically that's beyond me, many of these pieces are way beyond me, Lord. I don't even know what I'm doing half the time, but Lord, you'll you'll empower me. You'll, in, you'll give me a God encounter to help me to know what to do. Bring this equipment back to life, Lord. Our phones, bring them back to life, oh God, that we can take calls. Father, I pray for our affiliates, all of our station affiliates, Lord, from Phoenix, Arizona, on that digital powered station in Phoenix, to Lake Havasu, to Las Vegas, to Orlando, to New Orleans, to Detroit. God, add more stations. Give us more station owners to see the value of us praying with people in the middle of the night. I pray over my brother. I pray over my sister. I pray right now, Father, that every seed that they've sown in good ground springs up as a harvest, whether it be money or whether it be a smile, regardless of what that seed is, oh God, that it's in the ground. And I thank you, Lord, that you didn't wake up this morning and say, I think I'll have the sun sleep in. You didn't wake up and put summer on hold. You didn't pause winter. It's all laws that you've created. I can fly on an airplane because I know the law of thrust overcomes and supersedes the law of gravity. And so too does the law of seed time and harvest activate in our life, Lord. And I pray, Father, that each and every one, although somebody feels stuck in their ways, Help them, Lord. Help them. Help them to take a baby step when they don't know what to do next. Just a baby step. Get your Bible. Get it close to you. Come on. Come on, Jane. Come on, Terry. Come on, Joanne. Go get your Bible. Set your device down. Go get your Bible. The Lord loves this when I do this. I really believe this. He loves it when I promote the words of God. He loves it when I challenge you to thumb through the pages of the New Testament and ask of him. It's developing your relationship with him. Jesus loves it when I talk to him. Do you know that? He doesn't care if I'm in a swimming pool up to my neck in chlorine or walk in the neighborhood under the starry sky. He doesn't care. He just wants to hear from me. God can read my thoughts. But I'm very convinced that he would prefer to hear me talk to him. Because talking takes faith. I'm not talking. Who, where am I talking to? Where, who am I? It takes faith. God, I can't see you. I can't reach out and touch you. But I know you're there. Oh, God. Do I love you from the depths of my heart to the soles of my feet? I love you. I love you. I love you. There's nobody else like you. You're the first thing every morning. You're the last thing every night. I've watched God get out there with a bottle of anointing oil, Terry. Slap it on that front bumper and dedicate it to the Lord. Say, you know, I told the car one time, you may be a piece of junk. But you're going to be a sanctified piece of junk until I can replace you. <laughs> you know that thing stopped smoking and spitting and backfiring and started running like a normal machine supposed to run. You could walk everywhere, but you know, never do what a machine can do for you. Oh, do I feel his healing touch right now. When I think about the Lord. How he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost. Dennis, me and my wife love you and miss you. We miss coming to Phoenix, Arizona. The Lord gave me a release to go to some places today. I'll be announcing that towards the end of the week, Lord willing. It's not going to be a marathon. It's not going to be, 
you know, the rest of the year are always gone. It's going to be in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And we're our main focus, our primary focus is to push people to subscribe to our YouTube channel and be a part of this media ministry. We're reaching more people now than we've ever reached. And it's with your help. Pete, the Lord is going to use you in your prayer life. He hears you. Don't be discouraged. God hears you. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I declare that over your life right now. In the name that is above every other name. In the name of Jesus. Lord, take discouragement. Remember, Pete, the Bible says, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. That's Jesus. The government was never meant to be on Donald Trump's shoulders. It was never meant to be on your governor's shoulders. The government shall be upon his shoulders. And when he comes back, there'll be no king but Jesus. And he will rule supreme. That's why it's all messed up right now. That's why you feel the frustration. But take baby steps. Listen, I'm going to go today and pray we get everything fixed and i hope you got a word from the lord i i pray that you got something from god and uh nobody has given yet today but i'm hoping that somebody else will give as we go off and send me your prayer comments put them down below or if you're watching on a rebroadcast it doesn't mean i don't see the comments i see them get on this list my prayer list my partners i take it very very extremely serious it's big to me. Father, I pray for my brother. I pray for my sister. And I lift them up to you. And perhaps, Lord, if somebody is unsaved tonight, if they're not walking with you, I pray, Lord, you get them saved. Bring them into the kingdom. Just say it out loud. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of all sin. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Say, I confess Jesus is my Lord, and I believe God raised Jesus from the dead, and I'm saved. Amen. Welcome to the family. If you said that prayer, and uh, you let us know if you said that prayer. Remember, we still have some of these left, and I want to get them out to those who are giving $100 or more. You let me know you want one, and we'll ship it out to you. I'll pay the postage just for supporting this ministry of faith. I love you. God loves you. And we'll see you again tomorrow night. In the middle of your night, there's a Christian. You've been listening to Pray America Live with evangelist and radio pastor David Woods. Join us online with David Woods' Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope channels for a refreshing time of one on one prayer, testimonies, and singing. David Woods Ministries is supported by the love gifts and free will love offerings of partners just like you. You can become a radio. In the middle of your night, there's a Christian nightlight beaming the good news from 1,149 feet in the air, piercing the darkness with a bright ray of hope from the tallest freestanding observation tower in the